Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, this is Shamini Jan with the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, and I am sitting with Dr. Joe Tafur, who is a family physician and plant medicine healer. He has been studying and healing others with plant medicine for several years, um, including ayahuasca. And Joe has actually just written this incredible book, which is called The Fellowship of the River. And uh, he'll be speaking today at UC San Diego at the School of Medicine on his journey and his learnings and the research behind um, psychedelic medicine. So, Joe, thanks for doing this with me today. Thank you, Shamani. Thank you very much for having me here. It's mm. wonderful to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. I guess. You know, so Joe, Joe and I actually go way back. We, um, we both back. studied at, uh, at UC San Diego. He in medical school, and um, and I in graduate school, and we both have a mentor in common, Dr. Paul Mills. So we've enjoyed having numerous conversations over the years. And one of the areas, Joe, that I thought would be fascinating for you to share with our audience is the discussions that you and I have been having around um, plant medicine, ayahuasca medicine, and emotional healing, which I know is something you're really super passionate about. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, it's kind of, it's one of the main topics of the book and also, you know, some of what I want to discuss today. Um, the thing is, is as a family physician, you know, so I got, I, I, I went to medical school at UCSD and then eventually later on after doing family medicine residency, I, I did a postdoc uh, research fellowship at Paul Mills lab, you know, in large part because I knew Shalmany and that was through, oh, through connections. Yeah, well, right. I knew you and then recommended working with Paul's lab. Mm where, you know, I got exposed to the world of psychoneurominology and this mind-body research and mind-body healing. And then eventually as I got into plant medicine and also working as a, as a doctor and um, as a family physician, just seeing like, you know, there's a lot of frustrating cases out there. There are people that do get help with the, with the current medical paradigm, but there's a number of people who don't get help. And, um, and then as I went down eventually to the Amazon and watching these impressive healings that I observed there, uh, mostly Westerners, Americans, uh, Canadians, you know, Europeans, primarily leaving their culture and their medical paradigm, looking for healing in the Amazon outside of their culture in the same way that people have gone to India or, you know, other places to look for healing. Yeah. And seeing that they were getting this really impressive um, healing, a lot of them, like a very significant experience in their life and, and a lot of them you know, with profound shifts in there and even in physical symptoms. And so I was trying to figure out why, you know, what was linking the different kind of problems that I saw. And as I discussed in the book, in these varied cases, a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, from Vietnam uh, war exposure, uh, migraine headache problem, uh, you know, just chronic fatigue and body pain type stuff. Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, chronic cough that's not getting better, a dry cough that doesn't get better, you know, depression, addiction, anxiety, you know, all these kind of different, very different problems, at least in these individual cases, they all improve with this approach um, okay. with traditional Amazonian plant medicine. So tell me a little bit more for, you know, so many of our folks watching will have some familiarity with ayahuasca, but maybe not all do. So when you talk about plant medicine and you talk about this treatment can you explain um to, yeah. to others what what it what ayahuasca is and sure you know how it's how it's used traditionally so ayahuasca is a is a basically a tea uh made from primarily two plants um always the ayahuasca vine and then a different additional plant that is, is brought in to kind of bring in a visionary component sometimes other plants are mixed in and so that is a tea that's used in a spiritual healing ceremony um, throughout the Amazon the pan-amazonian uh, you know uh, medicine that you know we're talking Brazil Colombia Ecuador Peru you know um, primarily mm -hmm. And so it's uh, existing within a larger traditional Amazonian plant medicine tradition, just like there is traditional Chinese medicine and there's Ayurvedic medicine. And so ayahuasca is this is the shamanic component, which we consider kind of the spiritual healing component mm -hmm. of that larger plant medicine tradition. How long would you say that tradition has been around in the use of ayahuasca? Do you have a sense? Yeah, well, it's difficult. Like the archaeology in the jungle is very difficult, and so there's very little that we know uh, going back too far. But, you know, they estimate that it's, I don't know, it would, it would seem like at least thousands of years. Mm -hmm. you know? So thousands of years. And just to be clear, um, ayahuasca, you know, is considered, it is um, what is often called an entheogen, 
right? That's right. So ayahuasca is considered an entheogen or, you know, a psychedelic medicine previously described by Western medicine as hallucinogenic mm -hmm. in the sense that it uh, commonly inspires a visionary experience. And, um, you know, the, the root of the psychedelic term, that term is, you know, the psyche, mm -hmm. you know, the soul and delos meaning something about revealing. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea that somehow these are soul revealing helping people to get over uh, perhaps lock thinking patterns and mental blocks and things to kind of expose them to what's really maybe perhaps inside uh, their soul, so to speak, or what's coming from their emotional body or their emotional world that may be uh, trapped. And also perhaps that is also a portal to, to for more profound mystical experience. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the mind is blocking us from those things and, and this can help us kind of overcome um, just mental kind of rigid thinking or cultural ways that are blocking us from, from seeing things that uh, maybe are important to us and to our health. Mm. So there's so many places to go with this, and I'm so excited to hear your talk today, which is going to be at 4 p.m. Um, Pacific, and we are going to do our best to live stream it so that you can hear Joe talk about the science behind psychedelic medicine, including ayahuasca, um, as well as the clinical applications. So he'll be giving a really good in-depth discussion on a lot of these topics. But let's go to what we were discussing earlier. Um, ex can you help us understand how, you know, from your perspective as a doctor, as a healer, you know, as someone who studied plant medicine with the shamans um, in South America, how is it that going through the ayahuasca experience provides um, for emotional healing? And, and I'd also like to hear a little bit, and I know you're going to address this later today, but I'd like to hear any caveats that you might have um, around that for our audience. Are there times, for example, where the use of ayahuasca for emotional healing is not indicated? Yeah. Well, let me address that first, that, you know, the whole the experience that I'm sharing in the book and, and what I'm talking about is, is the use of ayahuasca within a... Uh, a spiritual and therapeutic context that's kind of um, amongst advanced practitioners. Mm -hmm. So this is not, you know, overnight, weekend trained uh, shamans, you know, playing around with ayahuasca. This is a multi-generational tradition uh, in which the advanced practitioner is considered to be somebody that has demonstrated, you know, significant discipline and has experienced over many years of practice and learning from people who have had similar experience. So this is advanced um, practice. So that being said, even within that setting, there are certain conditions which are high risk. You know, uh, right now it's been identified bipolar, schizophrenic, you know, individuals may be at risk of becoming destabilized by ayahuasca. So it's not recommended. Furthermore, <clears throat> people who have some kind of cardiovascular risk, you know, they're at risk for heart attack or stroke. Mm -hmm. An intense experience could push them into a problem. Mm -hmm. Then you have the issue of any kind of contraindicated medications. Uh, and then you have one more thing is that somebody has to be ready to integrate this experience. So somebody yeah. who's not very grounded and is kind of in a desperate place who doesn't have adequate support around them you know, may suffer uh, going through this experience and may be further destabilized. So it's something to be very careful with, and that is the traditional perspective on ayahuasca. It's not something to play around with. It's a very serious business that you need to be very careful with. That being said, all those things considered, you know, there are times when it can be a very uh, powerful healing tool. And how does it help <clears throat> emotional healing? So, well, I mean, just from the biochemical perspective, from the physiologic perspective, we know that these psychedelics are acting on uh, emotional parts of the brain, you know, limbic processing centers and, and this areas associated with the limbic system that are all involved in our emotional processing. Mm -hmm. So there's some deep emotional healing that is apparent on, you know, brain imaging and stuff like that. But now what is the person's subjective experience? Mm -hmm. You know, the issue is how do you get over, for instance, <clears throat> the guilt of of shooting someone in friendly fire. Uh, so we had there's one veteran, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan. I'm not sure where he had this happen. He accidentally shot his best friend, and his best friend died. Mm. And so he went through this big therapeutic process, and uh, with a lot of talk therapy, and was able to accept. Yeah, this is an accident. You know, I didn't mean to do this. This, you know, I don't. I 
I shouldn't feel guilty about this as guilty as I do. I should be able to let this go. Mm -hmm. But then how do you let that go? Yeah. And you need to go beyond, you know, the thinking mind and deep into the heart and your emotional being like forgiveness is a process, for example, that is initiated in the mind, but is only completed in the heart. And so how do you achieve that? How do you get there? Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people have a lot of difficulty in getting there and, and they're just, not able to get into their deep subconscious through some of the means that are available. Whereas these plant medicines can help guide the person through a spiritual experience, a mystical experience that kind of involves this spiritual context and spiritual support to learn how to do that and to go through that process. So would you say the experience is actually <clears throat> relived in some way? I mean, is it the experience that if someone, for example, we're now we're talking about emotional trauma. So does someone actually go through the process of re-experiencing that from some kind of a detached perspective? Is, is um, that how you often, it, right? often people re-experience emotional trauma, uh, and to the you know as part of a release is the traditional perspective. You know, mm -hmm. they sometimes they may relive it in a way that is kind of you know uh, still unnerving. But the idea is that it's a release and sometimes they're doing it and there's a, there's a little bit of a detached perspective in which they can kind of re-examine mm -hmm. and go through and finish out processing emotions that were not, that were cut off and shut down, mm -hmm. you know, because it was an overwhelming experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's just held there and frozen there. So allowing that to be processed out, like that's what, you know, the MDMA assisted psychotherapy uh for ptsd you know they're yeah. saying wow these people are now they're able to go back into these experiences not only revisit them and talk about them which you know the exposure therapy people are going through it is very helpful for many people to do that but it's noxious i mean it's as you know exposure therapy for ptsd is not well tolerated um by most folks and i mean i know that firsthand working with veterans here in san diego um, so yeah, so that's it's an it's an option, but as we see, like most people, you know, fifty percent of people are not responding to yeah. the therapeutic options in PTSD. So you're seeing like a massive, you know, a number of people that are, are not gonna that have no hope for treatment in the current paradigm. And then now with MDMA or you know people, there's a lot of veterans that are exploring ayahuasca for treating this kind of uh, you know trauma. And so with the help of in the case of the MDMA, you know, they're looking at it from purely biochemical physiologic perspective somehow it's just opening up this empathy with yourself and a detached perspective where you're not so triggered you know the same is probably true in some ayahuasca ceremonies but then you're adding this other component from the traditional perspective which is a spiritual guidance so let's talk that about process. that a little bit yeah what is the role of the shaman because you are talking about using ayahuasca here in the traditional settings where you know, I understand there's a whole process and, you know, we should probably do another video on what the actual ritual, if you will, with ayahuasca really is. But this is a very active process, not just for the participant. It's not like I drink a tea and, you know, I'm by myself and this is over. So if they're, for example, reliving um, emotional experiences, emotional trauma, there's a shaman there that is helping with this process. Yes. And what are they doing to help with the emotional um, with the emotional release, the emotional reliving, the emotional healing? What is the role of the shaman in this case? Well, there are many different um, ayahuasca traditions, you know, and so there's many different ways in which people all support other people going through that experience. You know, and it's the same as witnessed with the MDMA trials. You know, they, they have a sitter that's there that there is, you know, so to speak, as they first say, holding space, you know, mm -hmm. just being there in loving acceptance of the person mm -hmm. as they go through whatever it is they need to go through. So that's that's the first step that perhaps a lot of people are, are doing and offering within different traditions. And I can speak the Shipibo tradition that I'm trained in, you know, so this is a particular Amazonian tribe who has a particular way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Then you are guiding the process with song. So you use Icaros is called is the mystical healing song of, of the Amazon. And so these songs are to, you know, there's two ways to do it. One of them is just singing, you know, out to, to perhaps the group or singing to somebody else, you know, and, and what you're doing is vocalizing and trying to channel an energy mm -hmm. that's going to provide a, a spiritual support to that person. Mm -hmm. You know, which may sound very strange, but that's that's what goes on. And then there's a step further in the Shipibo tradition, which is one-on-one. -on -one. 
healing. In other words, where now the shaman is utilizing the ayahuasca they have also consumed to expand their visionary capacity to see what's going on with that person. Mm. And now to sing and address through their song what they see going on with that person and guiding them through a healing process with their song. And so that is the way we do it. So the Icaros is really, you know, a fundamental process to emotional healing and the ayahuasca tradition, at least in in your tradition. Yes, in the Shipibo tradition. And this is something that goes on over and over again is that people come down to the center and, you know, as they want to do is drink ayahuasca and find out what's up with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Then they start learning about this larger context that they're going to be on this diet and they're going to take these other plants to help guide their thing. And then they go to the Mm -hmm. ceremony Mm -hmm. and then so many of them walk out, whoa, it's all about the Mm Icaros. Like this ceremony is all about the Icaros. So for us, that's really vital to to the process and to guiding the process. And that's about putting the plant spirit, plant medicine forward through the song. There are other traditions, you know, that utilize ayahuasca in other ways. And, uh, I, you know, it's a different kind of environment. You know, this other environment with the Icaro based is is a little more focused on addressing like, you know, deeper emotional healing, perhaps than some of the more supportive environments and just ceremonial environments that are just, you know, where healing occurs in, in, and I think there's a very real phenomenon that does happen in which in the proper, like transparent, loving support, a lot can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there is this kind of idea of, of kind of psychic surgery, you know, in other words, to go in there and try to facilitate and help someone through uh, a process. I mean, what you're talking about, I know we've had this conversation before when I learned more about the whole, um, the whole ritual, I, sometimes I don't like to use that word, but it's, it's really an appropriate word, the whole ritual of the ayahuasca healing tradition, I was struck by, you know, what really just seemed to me that, you know, this is, this is basically spiritual healing. It's, it's plant-assisted spiritual healing. That is with, what it is. With, with song, with, you know, what many of us in the community will call energy healing or spiritual healing, um, you know, the belief in and the use of spirit really to help guide the process of emotional healing. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. That's kind of, agree that is that 100% or? correct. Like mm-hmm. it is a spiritual practice and it is a form of spiritual healing. And, and in that sense, you know, that's, you know, currently there is some role of religious freedom protecting things like peyote medicine, you know, mm-hmm. which is used as a sacrament and a spiritual practice, which often results in spiritual healing, but it's, it's not just done for that. And so similarly, ayahuasca is also utilized that way within the tradition. And so that's different from, and you know, there's a lot of research, they want to just really focus on the ayahuasca itself, you know, right. yeah. and, and that's fine. You know what I mean? I'm not against them doing that. A lot of people are against that mm. because they're worried that it's going to disregard the, uh, the spiritual component yeah. of, of the larger context and the spiritual healers. And we, use, we see this across the board, right, in what we call integrative medicine. Yeah. And these things generally have come out of some sort of spiritual tradition, and then in the West we, um, we view it from a very materialist lens, so it's got to be about the biochemical aspect of the plant, or it's got to be about you know, the neural structuring um, or restructuring that's going on during meditation. I mean, we see this with so many... Sure, healing sure, traditions, sure. Right? Well, even acupuncture, so, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then they try to, to simplify it down to the points and create study designs that disregard the tradition. Right. You know, for me, it doesn't matter that the reductionist will continue on their trajectory. Because why? Because their trajectory is not really giving the kind of results that the larger framework is giving. Well, so that's, that's where, from the clinical perspective... From the clinical perspective. And I'm not talking about yeah. the studies, right. you know, because the studies are going to be designed according to the paradigm, the right. reductionist paradigm, and they're going to get whatever they're going to get. Meanwhile, thousands of people are going to the Amazon mm-hmm. seeking healing. Yeah. They're not waiting for studies. You know what I mean? They're going because they know somebody that got help for something that the reductionist uh, paradigm did not help them for. Right. And that is a reality that is just going to keep screaming out. Yeah. And so the reductionist kind of perspective that want to kind of look down their nose at, at, at some of these uh, more, you know, woo-woo ideas. It's like, well, you know, it, that, that only holds as long as one of your loved ones doesn't need that kind of help. Mm. Then all of a sudden, that whole story breaks down. Yeah. And so that's, obviously, we want to be responsible. We're not against scientific knowledge. We want to learn. But we're not talking about disrespecting science. 
we're not talking about disrespecting knowledge. We're talking about helping people, genuinely helping people and being honest mm -hmm. about the statistics that we're looking at as far as yeah. what kind of results are we getting with well, anxiety and depression and yeah. PTSD and addiction right now. The materialist model has only taken us so far in our ability to heal. And, it, and you know, in large part, as you say, and many of us say, because we aren't looking at the emotional and spiritual roots of the issues. Right. Um, that's just, that's it's, just it's hard reality. to do that so then, with, the, with the current models that we have, whether we're talking psychotherapy, psychiatry, you know, uh, many forms of traditional what in the West are called traditional allopathic medicine. So and it raises have, the, yeah, by itself is allopathic medicine by itself. If you purely from that materialist lens, you know, we're missing out on this whole other dimension of being. And it just raises the issue that, you know, if you look at it culturally, you know, if we just take a step back, and say, why are we doing this? And then it just raises the question that, yeah, it seems that the, you know, the leaders of the thought leaders of this materialist paradigm don't want to go there mm -hmm. in their own personal lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't want to examine like mm -hmm. their emotional relationships, which of course would start with their loved ones and their children and their spouses and their larger mm -hmm. family and mm -hmm. their close friends. Mm -hmm. And so, because that's where it all begins. And so if we're just mm -hmm. like not going there, that that doesn't, that that's not real, that that doesn't influence my life mm -hmm. because I don't know the molecules involved is, you know, is, um, it's a sad lie that we are living. Yeah. That's it, you know? Yeah. And that's just like, so, mm -hmm. so it's like to think that, for example, love, to discuss love is unprofessional, mm -hmm. you know, is pretty a, backwards, it, isn't it? It's a profound, <laughs> it is a profound ignorance. Yeah. And yet now we're seeing some movement, obviously, you know, the, the, the leaders in the meditation research field have been doing wonderful work, as you know, over the last year or two, not a year, but several years to expand now beyond just what is meditation doing to my brain um, to, you know, what is meditation doing for us as a society? Practices like meditation, not just mindfulness meditation, but others. So, you know, there is hope. I want to thank a lot you. Of hope. We're not the only ones noticing that many yeah, people are noticing this. Are. And so there is yeah. a a huge movement and we're just a piece of that movement. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I want to thank you, Joe, for being here, for doing the work that you do. Yeah. So excited to have you speak today at UCSD coming full circle back to um, the university where you got your degree. Yeah. It's so huge. It's going to be fabulous. It's a huge opportunity. Thank you to Shamani for yeah. providing this opportunity. Well, thanks. Yeah. It, it all aligned perfectly. It was wonderful. So um, look forward to maybe seeing you guys at four o'clock today. Tune in for Joe's talk at UCSD. Thanks so much. Yeah.